uh, how consciousness can be really fitted into the framework of quantum physics. I think you are the best person in the world to talk about it. We welcome you, sir, and please deliver your lecture. Thank you so much, and I'm really delighted to be with you. I have been compromised by my time zone and not able to watch many of the proceedings closely, but I'm very interested in our speakers and very interested in the talks. I'm hoping they will be posted somehow online so that I can view them in my own time zone. I'm very excited to be with you and excited to share some, I think, new developments and the understanding of both uh, physics and Veda, you could say, and the relationship between the two. If it's all right, I'll share my screen. All right, so the title of this talk, as you may have seen, is, is Consciousness the Unified Field? A field theorist's perspective. We'll be talking a little bit about mind and quite a bit about matter and about that where that area where mind meets matter. So the earliest science, the oldest science that I'm aware of is astronomy. It's taught us a great deal about the world in which we live. As I said, it is the, the oldest science, as far as I know. I'm, I'm talking about science of this yuga, anyway. And developments in the science over the centuries really allowed us to do a great deal. Um, the observ observational instruments that I have photographed in Rajasthan and actually we've made a, a model replica here on our MIU campus, was really quite indicated to me a very sophisticated knowledge of the heavens uh, dating back some time in the Vedic literature. But things you know, have advanced since then with the web telescope, et cetera. And we've really been able to learn through astronomy a great deal about how stars work and dramatic relativistic astrophysical events like supernovas and quasars and black holes. And dark matter is an area where I continue to, to do both theoretical and experimental work. And also has taken us to a greater understanding of the origins of the universe and what is called inflationary cosmology, which is quite a spectacular and mind-bending achievement. But actually, for me, the most significant developments of the last 100 years, particularly the last 20, have been not in the realm of outer space, but in the realm of what I like to call inner space. Inner space means exploring deeper levels of nature's functioning, not at the astrophysical and cosmological scales, the very large, but looking within ourselves, looking within the structure of matter, to explore deeper levels of reality, smaller levels of reality. Um, starting with hundreds of years of dedicated to classical physics, the physics of concrete matter, macroscopic matter, now science turned inward in the 20th century and began to explore the, the world of the atom and molecules. And it turns out to understand the atom, a whole new language, a whole new logic, a whole new mathematics was required. And that's the logic, the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Without that counterintuitive new mathematical foundation, we couldn't otherwise understand one thing about the hydrogen atom. And then deeper we went into the world of the nucleus and subnuclear particles. And that actually acquired a whole new logic a whole new language, a whole new mathematics called quantum field theory, which is still the most precise and successful scientific theory in scientific history, able to compute things and understand things to seemingly infinite accuracy. So far, there are no chinks in the army 
in the armor of quantum field theory, except for the fact that it fails to understand gravity. And that we'll get to shortly. Gravity, of course, has been understood for some time in the language of general relativity. Einstein's general relativity, his theory of gravity is curved space, but it's incompatible with quantum mechanics. And that has been a huge conundrum until recently. Now, within particle physics, within nuclear and particle physics, there has been progress on that level by exploring still deeper into the nucleus at smaller and smaller scales using particle accelerators with higher and higher energies. And in that exploration of deeper and deeper levels of the fundamental particles and forces, uh, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery, those are two of my thesis advisors, Weinberg and Glashow. Also Salam, but I didn't study with him. To discover that two of the forces of nature, electromagnetism and the radioactive force, are indeed one when viewed from a deeper level, when explored at a more fundamental level of understanding. A hundred times smaller than the proton radius, radioactivity and electromagnetism are found to be the very same force. And after that, grand unified field theories, where now three of the four forces of nature, including now the strong force or nuclear force, are united as one. And beyond that, and this is later in the 20th century, unified field theories, completely unified theories in which all four forces of nature and all the particles of nature as well are united in the context of a single universal field of nature's intelligence. The discovery of unified field theories is really the fulfillment of Einstein's lifelong quest to try and uncover the fundamental unity of life the unified source of all the laws of nature, that fundamental intelligence which gives rise to all the laws of the nuclear force and the radioactive force and electricity and magnetism and gravity, that all the laws of nature emerge from there. So I want to just dwell on the unified field a bit. What is it really on its own level? Well, it is an unbounded field, an infinite field, it is an eternal reality. It is truly beyond time. It's a field of absolute silence, of, you could say, immortal silence. This field of nature's intelligence was there before the Big Bang. And it'll still be there when this universe ceases to be. So like an ocean, like an ocean of pure existence, this, this field, this ocean of pure being, pure existence, is silent at its core, never changing, in fact, beyond time. And yet, on the surface of this ocean, on the surface of this unified field, it is roiling and boiling with energy as an inevitable consequence of what is called the, the quantum principle or the uncertainty principle, which is a principle of increasing dynamism at the smaller and smaller scales. And since the unified field, the unification of the particles and forces occur at the most infinitesimal scale, the Planck scale, the dynamism at that level on the surface of this ocean is dramatic. And so we see erupting from this ocean of being, from this unified field, a sea of effervescent bubbles, rather like ginger ale, spontaneously effervescent bubbles. Now, these bubbles aren't ginger ale, in fact, surprise, but they have the structure of what are called superstrings. And a superstring is just, you could say, a rubber band. It's, a, it's an elastic loop. It's not made of rubber. It's not made of anything. These are, at this level of nature, wholly conceptual entities. So, but nevertheless, you can imagine an elastic string with no thickness. And that's the structure. 
that emerges, bubbles forth from the unified field. These are called superstrings. Now, superstrings, and this is kind of the miracle of string theory, this is a kind of a simple idea. Once you rule out particle physics, because quantum mechanics and particles don't fundamentally work together. And that's, that becomes really clear when you try to construct quantum theories of gravity. The, the real problem is the idea of a point particle of no dimension. These strings are, are small, but they're not point-like particles. They have a size, about the size of the Planck scale. So you, here we have, if you want to think of them as rubber bands percolating from this ocean of being, these rubber bands vibrate. And a graduate student can, can, can easily do the mathematics to enumerate the different ways a rubber band can vibrate. They can vibrate clockwise, they can vibrate counterclockwise, they can vibrate like this, they can vibrate like that. It's not that hard a problem to enumerate the vibrational <laughs> modes of a rubber band. These rubber bands happen to live in 10 plus one, 10 space-time dimensions which makes the mathematics a little more complicated, but nevertheless, it's not an intractable calculation. And you can calculate the different vibrational modes of these superstrings, which yes, live in higher dimensions, but ultimately it boils down to three plus one. You can enumerate them and you can actually calculate the energy of vibration of all these different vibrational modes, vibrational options. Some are very slow and lazy. Some are very high energy, very frenetic. So these vibrating strings, these super strings have different energies, which according to Einstein means they have different mass because E equals MC squared. So you have these vibrating strings with different masses. And the miracle of string theory is that these masses that are calculated just purely on paper based on the simple premise that the unified field percolates the vibrating strings, loops, you discover the masses of those particles and the properties of those particles match the masses and properties of the particles of nature that we know and love, like the electron and the quarks and the neutrino and the photon of electromagnetism. So they emerge basically as strings emerging from the unified field in different states of vibration. And if you look at the force of gravity, for example, gravity and all phenomena of gravity, curved space-time, are due to clockwise vibrating strings. When superstrings vibrate in clockwise fashion, they, they have spin two, and they have zero mass, and they are indeed gravitons, clockwise vibrations of the string. The other three forces of nature, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, the radioactive force, those are a consequence of counterclockwise vibrations of superstrings. So that explains the origin of all the forces of nature. In the particles that we're gonna have for supper this evening, that our bodies are made of, that the earth is made of. Those are the electron and the quarks, which make up the protons and the neutrons, which together make up the atoms and the molecules. Those are slightly more complicated vibrational states of these super strings. And, and there you have it, that string theory at a glance. So because the fundamental particles are at the basis of everything, the basis of material basis of atoms and molecules and macromolecules, organic molecules, the DNA, organ systems, human beings, all animals, the planet Earth, the galaxies, the whole universe emerges from the unified field as is seen in detail from string theory. Too many calls. So that is quite a triumph of modern science. The string theory has allowed us to confront problems that were just incomprehensible before. What happens at the center of a black hole? What happens when the entire mass of a star is compactified to a point of no dimension? Well, no previous theory of physics could handle those distances. 
But in string theory, it's it's clear what's happening in there, and it's clear what will happen next in the future of that black hole. What happened before the Big Bang? That was a question which could not be answered with previous theories. But string theory has its roots in the timeless unified field. And we can talk intelligently about what happens, how the universe emerges. So I'm going to switch gears for a moment to just talk about, we've talked about particles coming from the unified field, from the string field. I'd like to talk about the universe as a whole, just very briefly, because I think it's fun. So Big Bang Theory goes something like this, if you let me paraphrase. In the beginning, there was eternal silence. But within that silence was the faint hum of dynamism. These are the eternal fluctuations of the unified field within itself. Even before the Big Bang, the unified field is reverberating within itself. It's intrinsically dynamics. The quantum principle guarantees that. And then one day, and lo, that vacuum energy surged. And it brought forth in a mighty roar a space-time bubble that grows bodaciously, enormously, exponentially. And that exponential growth of this tiny bubbling baby universe matures into a universe through processes that we are somewhat familiar with. Again, this growth of the universe in the inflationary cosmology is fueled by vacuum energy. That's the dynamism of the unmanifest. And emerging from that Reverberating silence on the top left is the is a growing universe. It grows exponentially, and many dramatic things happen in the first fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. There's nucleosynthesis, and, and nuclei are born, and atoms are born, but ionized atoms, basically, free atoms, free electrons. But after 300 years of the universe expanding and cooling, it cools enough that the electrons begin to stick to the nuclei to form neutral atoms. And the moment that happens, suddenly the universe of matter becomes neutral. And being electrically neutral now, as atoms mostly are, these atoms are free from the buffeting effect of the electromagnetic radiation that fills the universe at this early time. So once the atoms are free, no longer buffeted by the electromagnetic field all the time, they're free to, to do what they want to do, which is gravitate together. Atoms have mass, and in bulk, they have a lot of mass, and they start to gravitate into galaxies and stars. And what we're seeing now, 13.8 billion years later, is the universe that, as predicted, looks just like our own. This creation story, of universes bubbling out of abstract being is kind of familiar in the Vedic literature. This idea of, of bubble universes emerging and expanding is, is shown in some of the Vedic art, showing the ocean of being represented by Lord Narayana and lotus-born Brahma, born from the lotus of the ocean of being is, is a universe. And Vedic art like this, which is that ocean of being, just within its own silence, lively silence, is just conceptualizing and seeing and in effect creating many universes. And in fact, if we had time, this is what quantum cosmology says is happening. A multitude of universes that are really, you know, not fundamentally material, but are more conceptual in nature. And that's what quantum mechanics has been saying for years. Matter isn't matter. Matter is made of 
wave functions, which are basically vectors in Hilbert space, which are ba basically objects of the imagination. I'll leave this because it's, it's you're getting into an interesting area and come back to the theme of, of today's talk. We're going to talk for a moment about what is mind, having talked a bit about matter. What is consciousness? Well, our mind, I'm going to move something out of the way so I can see this a little better. Here we go. Our minds, rather like matter, are structured in layers. At the surface mind, we have what are called gross thoughts or articulated thoughts. Articulated thoughts flood our mind all the time. This is the endless chatter that goes on inside our minds. And these thoughts are of a spoken nature. They're made of words. You're too polite to speak them out loud, I hope, but the thoughts you may be having are bubbling in your mind. Human beings have the capacity for more profound and subtle thinking, so-called abstract conceptual thought. We all have that capability. We wouldn't have language if it weren't for that capability for abstract thought. Concepts like dog are not very, are, are, are concepts. They're a dog represents a Chihuahua, a Great Dane, a Labrador, a Bull Mastiff. It's a convenience. We have a word dog because we can't have a different word for everything, although we have many. So abstract conceptual thought and beyond abstract thinking is our fine feeling, our intuition. And beyond fine feeling, beyond the most subtle intellect, is being, pure consciousness, inner wakefulness, the most abstract level of the human mind, but the most intimate to ourselves, because we are that consciousness. Our consciousness is what we are. It's that who sees in within us, who knows. So consciousness is, is, is vitally important, but it is abstract, and in waking state, it is largely missed. In waking consciousness, we're aware of this and we're aware of that. We're thinking this, we're feeling that. But the seer, the thinker, the feeler, the self is not seen in waking consciousness. It's transcendental. So we have these different levels of mind. And amazingly, these different levels of mind are intimately related to the deeper levels of physical nature. We're not, we're not separate from nature. Human structure, physical body, subtler particles. We, we are part of nature. We have the same structure of nature, and our consciousness has that same structure. If I can get to the next slide, I'm not quite sure if I'm not getting to it. Let me try this, sorry. Ah, oh, yes. So these four levels of mind, let me go back one actually, in the Vedic literature, in the literature of yoga, they're called vaikari after the word bhak, speech. These are spoken thoughts. Madhyama, abstract conceptual thinking. Pashyanti, fine feeling level, means vibrating consciousness. And Atma, pure consciousness, and it's silence. So mathematicians of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century have really refined the different levels of expanded human awareness. They've divided the mind more finely into its most concrete, to its most sublime, most abstracted, most expanded. And they've invented a language that captures each of these levels of mind. The counting numbers, one, two, three, these are the most concrete numbers. Everybody understands them. And they're very practical for shopping. Uh, some smart mathematician from India, I believe, at some point invented the concept of zero. Now, zero may not sound like much of a thing, but actually it is. It's the additive identity. And when you add zero to one, two, three, you have the whole numbers. And the whole numbers are more powerful. You can prove things about numbers that you couldn't prove in the absence of the additive identity. Somebody then added the concept of negative numbers. Now you have the integers. 
Now you can define subtraction. This is a more complete system. It's a more robust and logically complete system. It, you can now define subtraction where you couldn't properly before. And then in between the integers are the fractions. And when you add all the fractions that you can possibly write down, you have the rational numbers. Rational numbers are starting to be quite useful. If you're an accountant, for example, you can get by with your mastery of the rational numbers. For physics, you need the real numbers. For classical physics, you can't do calculus, and Newton couldn't have done what he did without the concept of the continuum, which means you fill in all the spaces between the fractions. Then you have the complex numbers, where, which are essential for quantum mechanics. So the, these are more complete, more profound, more powerful mathematical systems, and increasingly abstract. You can't even write down a real number unless you are content to spend eternity writing those fractions down, but you never quite hit the target. Complex numbers, imaginary numbers, are, are far more abstract <laughs> to comprehend than that. Beyond that, if you want to do quantum field theory, you need what are called function spaces, which involve huger, bigger, and bigger infinities, more and more abstract. To do string theory, you need limits of function spaces and products of function spaces and include the, the largest conceivable infinities. These are the hugest mathematical concepts, the most abstract and enormous of concepts. Products of function spaces involve, describe what are considered to be the largest infinities that are comprehensible to a human mind that are amenable to the laws of logic. And yet mathematics have proven the existence of what they call infinity beyond comprehension, which is an infinity that is bigger than the largest comprehensible infinity, but it is not articulable. You can prove its existence, but it's literally beyond the intellect. So we have these different levels of mind, and all of us are capable of fathoming these depths. Some maybe have more of an aptitude than others, but these are just more abstract and more comprehensive and more, more powerful levels of mind that you need for the most advanced physics. So at the foundation of this, mind is consciousness. Pure, abstract, unbounded awareness, which is beyond the biggest concept and more abstract than any concept. So these levels of mind, we could say are more expanded levels of awareness. David Lynch, who's the head of our film program here at MIU, he, he says, this is where the big fish swim meaning these are where the big ideas of physics, the big ideas of philosophy, the big ideas in film, these are where the world-changing ideas in computer science come from. So the idea here is to develop the mind, expand awareness, and capture those big ideas that will change civilization. So this amazing correspondence, all these different levels of mind, all these different layers of mathematics, each corresponds to a different level of physical reality. These deeper levels of math, these more expanded languages of the mind, fit nature like a glove. They're needed to understand the atomic level, quantum mechanics. They're needed to understand quantum field theory. They're needed to understand unified field theory. So there's this intimate tie between the structure of our mind and the structure of physical nature. And Einstein commented on that. Eugene Wigner, father of the atomic age, said, described the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. Why would these mathematicians, these, these mathematical systems, which are products of the human mind, why would they fit nature like a glove? Well, that is this that's because the human mind and human being is a product of the laws of nature. We have structure within our own bodies at all these different levels of nature. And we're part of physical nature. And at the foundation of mind is pure consciousness. The origin of it all 
that the foundation of what we call physics or physical creation is the unified field, the origin of it all, in this relationship between mind and matter suggests strongly, in my, my opinion, that pure consciousness, universal consciousness, unbounded awareness, samadhi, is where the individual mind identifies with the unified field, where human intelligence expands to identify with nature's intelligence, becomes one with the intelligence at the foundation of the universe. In other words, that pure consciousness in the unified field are one thing, are the same, but approach through very different approaches, using a very different language, but nevertheless, ultimately the same. Okay, I want to talk for a few minutes about what is meditation in the classic Vedic sense, because that will have a role to play here. So we live mostly on the surface level of our mind. Every thought we have that springs into our mind, I left my car running. When is this guy going to stop? These all emerge from deeply within, deep within, as a faint impulse, a faint abstract impulse of thought that makes its way up through the machinery of the thinking process, through the mechanics of thought formation, to become more concrete, more fully formulated, more comprehensible. And at some point, that thought bursts onto the surface of our mind, and we recognize, I, I, left, the, I left the keys in the car. That process is quick, half a second typically, sometimes longer, so otherwise we'd be tongue-tied continuously, but it happens. Meditation, in the classic sense of yoga and Veda, is beginning on the level of from where we are, which is mostly engaged in surface thought, but these are techniques, yoga are techniques to turn the intention powerfully within, be, to begin to experience and explore deeper levels of thought, finer levels of the thinking process, fainter, more abstract levels of thought, fainter and finer, even beyond the finest feeling. The mind slips beyond that to experience purely consciousness. Pure consciousness, samadhi. Yoga, the yoga sutras begin. Yoga, experience of inner unity, is simply the complete settling of the activity of the mind. Then it continues in the next verse. Then the knower, then the seer, is established in the self, the big S self, one's own unbounded universal consciousness. In the literature of yoga, the Upanishads, it's this state of samadhi is described as the peaceful, the blissful, the undivided or unified. It's thought to be the fourth state of consciousness, distinct from waking, dreaming, or deep sleep. That is the self. That is to be known. Or in more science terms, in terms of physiology today, this is called a hypometabolic physiological state, which simply means a state of very deep physiological rest and very, very high state of brainwave coherence, the meditative state. This experience of samadhi was relatively rare among individuals, and it's not something that typically dawns frequently in one's life. It can. But with a technique from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the Transcendental Meditation Technique that Marshi brought, really revived in India and brought out to the whole world. There are millions and millions of practitioners and uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of published studies on this effect of pure consciousness, of samadhi. And for one thing, it's a state of profound rest and prof uh, of uh, a profound reduction and anxiety compared to any other methods of anxiety management. And because most disease is either caused or complicated by stress, regular practice of transcending brings marked reductions in 
every category of disease, except childbirth, which is arguably not a disease, but all the other categories of, of medical expenditure are markedly reduced. And these studies have been done again and again by major insurance companies. The American Heart Association uh, uniquely prescribes transcendental meditation as the only one that has been shown to clinically reduce blood pressure, to, to, to have clinical significance. It's a, a deeper level of meditation or rest than something like something else, mindfulness, for example, would be. And in this huge study, which is a 10-year study funded by the National Institutes of Health, this is a $24 million study, found that heart attack, stroke, and death, heart attack, stroke, and related death, fell two-thirds in heart patients that took their 20 minutes and of practice twice a day. And that was really an astounding medical finding. That really put the idea of mind-body medicine on the map for the first time with serious medical practitioners. I want to quickly talk about meditation and brain development. That's important to me as a researcher. It's important to me as a professor. It's important to our university. Let's talk about this state of samadhi. In normal waking consciousness, the brain is rather scattered. There's relatively little coordination or communication between different parts of the brain. The brain is basically, it's not well coordinated. During the meditative state, we find this remarkable synchronization across the entire brain. And this brainwave synchrony, it fades after meditation, but some of it does remain. Brain becomes more coherent, more orderly. And that orderly brain functioning correlates in many, many studies that have since been done in increased intelligence, IQ, improved learning ability, better academic performance, better executive functioning, greater creativity, greater alertness, improved moral reasoning. We could use a little of that today in the world. Decreased neuroticism, increased stability, and all of that. So brainwave coherence is good. And in fact, and if the I'll... increase in intelligence, as measured by IQ, and there are several measures of IQ, but they all lean on the same measures. These are the basic measures. Highly statistically significant improved in students and adults, even in the elderly, through the experience of regular contact with samadhi, the experience of, of deep meditation. And that's what really broke the logjam in the U.S. and around the world, where finally the public schools, starting in San Francisco, where today you know, thousands of schools and millions of students have introduced TM into the classroom, into the school day, because of the terrific results in terms of academic achievements, that the students make. No more than in India. India has the most of these consciousness-based schools, schools that incorporate the development of consciousness in a direct way through yogic meditation into the educational program. So samadhi, the experience of pure consciousness, wide awake within its own nature, in its own being. That experience is an experience of, if you wish, it's purely consciousness, pure abstract awareness. It's not that fireworks go on when you achieve that state. It's a state of absolute repose, awareness that is unbounded, meaning there's no specific content to localize consciousness. It's not hot, it's not cold, it's not sweet, it's not salty, it's not, not two feet by one foot. It's attributeless, and therefore the mind is free of any localizing effect, unbounded awareness. Marshi calls that level of life the absolute in comparison to everything else which is in the changing relative, the ever-changing relative world. Never changing versus ever changing. Very distinct, pure consciousness. Very distinct, this unified field. It's really beyond the universe. 
field of unity versus a world of incredible diversity. A field of absolute silence in comparison to a universe of incredible dynamism. Now, the purpose of meditation is not just to bury yourselves in silence, and that experience is a stepping stone to the result, but the ultimate result is to live that silence in the midst of dynamic activity. The experience of silence, that unbounded silence, is called samadhi. The integration of that experience, along with the outer activities of our lives, with outer dynamism, is called enlightenment. Fourth state of consciousness is samadhi. Fifth state of consciousness is samadhi stabilized during waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Always there. The light of consciousness switched on and remains on. In terms of brain functioning, it's a highly coherent, most fully functioning state of the brain. You can see during the meditation practice, the high bursts of EEG coherence across the entire brain, whether it's a new meditator, four months, or an advanced meditator, eight years. The difference is that the eight-year meditator maintains that coherence and inner wakefulness even in the midst of dynamic activity. This is neurophysiological evidence of higher states of consciousness. And coherence is a good thing, as we've seen. Enlightenment is, I'll be very quick about this because we have some more key physics points to get to. Enlightenment is also called self-realization because in the experience of life in cosmic consciousness, we have our outer gross experience, a sensory experience, a concrete thoughts and feelings. But underneath it all, underlying it all, is never broken, never changing silence, inner contentment, inner stability, inner invincibility, inner self unbounded as a silent witness to the drama of our daily activity. Now, without that inner self awake, then consciousness is present or we wouldn't be awake. But consciousness itself is unseen. It's not in the picture. It illuminates everything else, allows us to see everything else, but it itself remains hidden. And in that state, a person is vulnerable because our outer life is always changing. We have, we have good days, we have bad days. And we say good hair days and bad hair days. And unfortunately, my hair days are all bad. But at the foundation, of that, if the inner light of consciousness is on, that inner reality is so unboundedly huge and grand and dignified and inherently blissful that the outer waves just simply don't ever overthrow you. They just are not enough to touch that inner silence and inner stability. So inner peace, inner contentment. And I'll mention this quickly a growing ability to achieve one's desires. Remember, there are different levels of thought, and the deeper levels of thought are more powerful. A Christian might say, with a mustard seed of faith, you can move mountains. The mustard seed is the key. It's the infinitesimal impulse of thought as it rises, emerges from the ocean of being. Those are the truly powerful thoughts. So our minds and levels of thought, Vaikari, Madhyama, Ashanti, if you wish, concrete thoughts, abstract reasoning, fine feeling, and pure being, these levels of our mind correspond to different levels of nature, macroscopic, classical reality, quantum reality, quantum field theory, and unified field theory. The greatest power in thought is here at its inception, at the point of emergence of thought from being. With one foot planted in being and the other foot in the relative, in the finest relative, but capable of entertaining a desire, that desire has its foundation in universal being, the unified field, 
And those thoughts are powerful. This is the principle behind the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, Sanyama, or the TM City program, as that practice of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are called uh, today in the world, that Marshi brought out to the world. So, back to the question. Is consciousness the unified field? As seems intuitively plausible, based on the fact that pure consciousness, the origin of mind, the origin of human experience, and pure consciousness, unified field, the origin of the material structure of the human being and the material structure of everything, the origin of both should be the same origin. I'm going to just uh, give you a few arguments in favor of that, strong ones. Well, there is common sense argument that the deepest aspect of human existence, the unified field, pure consciousness, it should be the same deepest aspect of everything else in nature, which is called the unified field. We're part of nature. Unified field is the source of everything. Pure consciousness is the source of human experience. Those sources are undoubtedly the same. But let's move on. There are certainly strong qualitative comparisons we could say about the unified field of physics and the unified field of pure consciousness at the basis of the mind. And people have taken that quantitative and that qualitative description and analysis to great lengths. I'm not going to dwell on the profound qualitative similarities between pure consciousness and the unified field because I think we can do better. Physicists, physical scientists, don't tend to trust semantics. Um, they'd rather see something, you know, more concrete, more mathematical, more numerical, if there can be such a numerical correspondence. That would be more powerful. And that's what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. It turns out there is a very precise quantitative that means structural correspondence between pure consciousness and what we call the unified field. In that precise quantitative correspondence between the structure of consciousness and the structure of the unified field is found on two levels, relative and absolute. By relative, I mean that correspondence is seen on the finest level of the material expressions of the unified field. Let's start with the what emerges from the unified field, the material expressions of the unified field. Well, in physics, the unified field sits at the foundation of this, the chart of life. And deep within the world of the fundamental particles, Deeper than the electroweak unified field, there is grand unification. And I'd like to look at the structure of grand unification, which is the first to emerge from the unified field. The structure of grand unification. Grand unification is a deep level of nature's functioning in which a tremendous amount of unification has already taken place. Not the absolute unity of the unified field, but a lot of unity. On the level of grand unification, on the top right of this chart, you'll see all the spin one forces. You'll see electromagnetism, radioactivity, the strong nuclear force. All those forces unite as one force in grand unification. So there's only one force at that level of nature. The matter fields, which you can see in the middle of the chart to the right, it's called the spin one half matter. Those are the, the quarks and the electrons, which make up the protons and the neutrons and the atoms and the molecules. It also includes neutrinos. At the level of grand unification, those are all one. All those different so-called spin one half particles have become united. The Higgs boson has no spin and it stands on its own, the so-called much vaunted God particle, which I, I find to be an exaggeration. On the left is the graviton, which is a particle of spin two, the force of gravity. 
and next to it something called the gravitino. These five spin types, these fundamental particles are generally found spinning, but they spin with different amounts of angular momentum. The Higgs boson has none. Spin one half particles have a little bit. Spin one forces have more spin, more angular momentum. Spin two graviton, the most angular momentum. So the particles at this point are really only distinguished by their spins. So we're at a level of nature's functioning that is quite simple. And deeper than that, on the verge of unity, is called supersymmetry in the language of physics. These three, these five entities, merge into three more holistic entities called superfields. The gravity superfield, the force or gauge superfields, the matter superfields. These are really non-material entities. They're, they're holistic. They are subtle essences, I would call them. But from these subtle essences, from these things that don't even have defined spin, all the five spin types emerge, and everything then emerges from there in a process of increasing diversification. Manifestation is a process of diversification from unity to diversity. This is what how physics describes the structure of creation as it emerges from the timeless unified field. That's the story of physics. Let us talk about consciousness, pure consciousness. If you want to understand consciousness and what emerges from consciousness, this is the speciality of Veda. What emerges from pure consciousness in terms of these physical elements, these five uh, Mahabhutas and these three Prakritis, or three sometimes called doshas, what emerges from consciousness is probably best laid out in Rig Veda and its Upaveda Ayurveda. In particular, we could look at Chark Sanghita. There are several others that would also do. And we see that what emerges from pure consciousness, what emerges from pure Veda, are three Prakritis, these subtle essences, these finest constituents at the basis of the human physiology, and of course, therefore, at the basis of everything. And these five can be differentiated, these three, fundamental, can be differentiated into five, the Pancha Mahabhutas, the five elements. And this structure of one to three to five to many is the very same structure that has recently emerged in cutting-edge understanding of the universe through physics. This pairing, this relationship between the five, the Panchamabhutas, the five elements, the three Prakritis, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, and the five spin types on the left, and the three superfields on the left, is a precise correspondence. In physics, these pairings and only these pairings are mathematically possible. And just quantitatively, the likelihood of this parallel structure is between one in a thousand and one in 2,500, 2,400, if you, depending upon your assumptions when you do those statistics. It's an unlikely coincidence. This is a real connection. And it's not just that they numerically compare. If you look at the top of this chart, we see something called Akasha on the right. Akasha is one of the five elements. What is Akasha? Well, people say space. A better word for it is ether, because it's not space as we often think of it as an empty stage, just an empty stage in which the actors unfold, in which the universe unfolds. It's more than that. It's a subtle substance. Okay, well then on the left side of the chart, what is the spin to graviton? What is the force of gravity? It's space, it's curved, it's not space as an empty stage, it's curved space-time geometry. Space-time is a very subtle fluid, according to Einstein. 
It's called a relativistic fluid. It has no viscosity, but it flows and it warps. It's a kasha. And we could go through these at length, but it don't have time, one by one. And you can say that the, the five, the pancha mahabhutas, are the same as the five spin types. So this is really you know, a remarkable correspondence at the very foundation of creation, which would be strong support for the proposal that pure consciousness, pure being, the absolute, and the unified field of physics are two different words for the very same thing. Um, that is an important quantitative correspondence. For the fun of it, let me see what time it is. Okay, so I'm going to end on time. So I'm going to move more quickly. I just want to show you and just let it pass over you. Let it pass over you. There's a second type of quantitative correspondence, not in terms of what comes out of the unified field, but what's going on inside the unified field. What is the structure of the unified field itself? What is the structure of pure Veda? What is the structure of the unified field of physics? So we're not, instead of looking what comes out of the unified field, let's examine what is inside the unified field. Inside the unified field of string theory, inside the field of pure consciousness or Veda. This is going to be a fast moving movie. Don't try to follow my words. Flow with me for three, four, five minutes, and you'll at least get a feeling for it. Beyond that is just not something we have time for, but it's something I think we should all see, at least in fast motion. String theory is a theory of vibrating strings. A guitar string is an example of a vibrating string. A guitar string lives in three dimensions plus time. So the string itself takes up one dimension, leaving the string free to vibrate in the two perpendicular dimensions. So you can strum a guitar string essentially in two different ways, vertically and horizontally. You can do them both at once. One could be playing one note, the other could be playing overtones of that note. So like that, superstrings, which live in nine plus one dimensions, one being time, have eight perpendicular dimensions in which superstrings can vibrate. So superstrings, these elastic loops, can wiggle, so to speak, in eight perpendicular dimensions. This is the structure of the simplest string theory, the D equals 10 superstring. So looking inside the unified field, we see that the unified field has this rich spectrum of internal vibrations and is really continuously reverberating within that reality. The unified field is reverberating wholeness with eight fundamental frequencies. However, the string theory, like a moth, a butterfly, a worm becoming a butterfly or a salamander becoming a frog, undergoes a profound internal metamorphosis in which this 10-dimensional string morphs into what is called the E8 crossed E8 heterotic string. It's the same theory. You turn it inside out and you flip it upside down, and it has a very different appearance, an appearance that's getting closer and closer to the physical world. That metamorphosis means that in this what's it called heterotic string, has a different vibrational structure. For the right moving vibrations, it's still got these eight degrees of freedom, but the left moving vibrations of these superstrings live in a higher dimensional space, 26 dimensions, with 24 vibrational free degrees of freedom. So basically, there's a much richer vibrational structure. Moving along quickly, what's next? What's next is we don't live in 10 dimensions. We live in four, three plus one. What happens to the extra dimensions in string theory? They get spooled up, like spooling up a piece of paper into a straw. They get spooled up into such tiny tubes, they disappear from observable sight. But those tubes are elastic. And, and these tubes have elastic vibrations, like a wiggling worm, as you can see in this picture. And when you actually count the new vibrational options that come once you compactify space into a tiny circle, tiny tube, 
you get 64 more vibrational degrees of freedom, which means that the unified field is, is really reverberating within itself with a very rich spectrum of vibrations, of excitations, reverberating wholeness. And what's next, and we're, we're getting to the end of this, thank God, is these strings do not actually spool up in such a tidy fashion. It's not that these extra six dimensions all form a perfect circle, creating this very simple geometric shape. It, the curling up of this extra dimensions is not in the form of a hyper circle. It's in the form of something called a six dimensional Calabayao space. There is a Calabayao space projected on two dimensions. We get a sort of sense for this multiply connected topologically complex surface on which these extra dimensions curl up. Once they curl up, instead of having tubes, you have the tubes. Ignore these yellow rubber bands for a moment. These tubes are still there. And these tubes still wiggle like wiggling worms, and they still produce the extra 64 dimensions of the reverberant structure of the absolute, of the Veda. But in addition to that, those are the 64, but in addition to that, these rubber bands, these are super strings that get tangled up on this topologically complex hidden space-time. And these rubber bands themselves can vibrate back and forth stuck around these tubes. And you can count those vibrations if we have a lot of time. And there are 128 additional vibrational frequencies within the unified field created by that option. So the total vibratory structure of the unified field is this reverberating wholeness with 192 frequencies. That's this sequential metamorphosis from one, from eight, to 24, to 64, to 192. And from there, the universe emerges. The 192 fundamental particles and forces of nature emerge from there. The universe at that point is ready to, to sprout. That's from string theory. Reverberating wholeness, 192 fundamental frequencies. Let's look at the Veda for a moment, Rig Veda. Rig Veda, let's look at the vibrational modes of universal consciousness, sometimes called the vrittis, the fluctuations of Atma. It has the same structure. This was all cognized by Veda Vyasa long, long ago, but Maharishi's really brought that back out in, in vivid clarity. The entire Rig Veda begins with A. Ah. A ah captures the wholeness of the Veda. The entire Veda is contained in A, ah, but it's very difficult to discern the details. But Veda is a continuously self-expressing, self-manifesting, self-commenting reality. It emerges. The first to emerge from the first syllable of the Veda, which is A, ah, is the first para of the first sukta of the Rig Veda, Agnimele Parohitam. That eightfold emergence is basically the emergence of the eight prakritis. And it is, again, the whole story of the Veda, but still in a rather compact form. The next stage of emergence of the Veda is the first richa of the first sukta of the Veda, which has 24 syllables. And this is just a more elaborated elaboration of the reverberations, all abstractly contained within the reality of A. Ah. You can see in parallel the bottom, we've gone from 1 to 8 to 24 as the internal vibrational structure of the unified field, in this case, the unified field of consciousness. After that, the subsequent eight riches of the first sukta of the Veda unfold in 64 vibrational degrees of freedom and more fully unfold in 192 vibrational degrees of freedom. That's the entire first richa, first sukta of the Veda, first chapter of the Veda. And the entire Rig Veda is based on that structure. The first mandala of the Veda has 192 suktas. Those 192 suktas 
are an unfoldment and an elaboration of these 192 syllables. Like that, the Veda unfolds itself in a remarkable sequential fashion from unity to virtually infinite diversity. So, and then from these 192, again, the universe emerges. So what we're seeing here is a remarkable parallel that the structure of the unmanifest, the structure of the Veda, seen by Veda Vyasa, it assembled many, many rishis, but all of their hymns were assembled into the structure of the Veda we see here today by Vyasa. In parallel to that, great, you could say, modern sages like Ed Witten, for example, who is an absolute genius, using not experiment, because we don't have any experiments that will touch the unified field, anything anywhere close to the Planck scale, but using the analytic and intuitive capabilities of the mind, Ed Witten and other string theorists have divined this same structure. So this correspondence and structure between the unified field of physics and the structure of the unity of consciousness and its reverberations in the form of Veda are a very powerful thing. This is, you could say, the numerical beef that some of my physics colleagues have been waiting for. I presented this at 108 universities around the world. And it's something that is striking even to the more materialistic members of those physics audiences. So there we are. Um, the last argument I'm not going to go into, but I do want to state it. These days, in the last 20 to 25 years, there have been experiments confirming the existence of what we could call field effects of consciousness, long-range influences of consciousness. These phenomena are most easily and naturally explained through a unified field theoretic mechanism which I won't really have time to go into, but here it is. I ran this experiment, conducted this experiment in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1993. We had 4,000 people coming from across the world who were advanced meditators, siddhas, who made a public demonstration with a 27-member scientific review board of the leading sociologists and conflict experts in conflict resolution in the country, including the FBI and the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. We predicted in advance, based on, at that point, 42 previous experiments that we would see, as soon as the group gathered in number, a marked reduction in crime by 20, over 20%. 20 we had 23.8% in a highly statistically significant fashion. Before that, though, there had been many studies of great, great practical importance the war in the Middle East that was raging in the mid-1980s, some researchers thought they would assemble a large group of advanced meditators right in Jerusalem, right in the heart of the conflict. And over a two-month period, the number of people in that meditating group rises and falls. And as it rises and falls, progress towards peace in the Middle East rose and falls. Mark reductions in war deaths, war injuries, number of bombs dropped, bullets fired, and, and great positive progress towards peace among the negotiating factions, rival factions. When that was published in the Yale University Journal of Conflict Resolution, it what created kind of, I would say, a sensation. And the editors of that journal said that study is impeccable, the statistics are undeniable, they urged other groups, other scientists, can you repeat this experiment? This is obviously a potential great significance if you can turn off war like a light switch. 80% drop in war deaths, et cetera, in each. And in the next two and a quarter years, six additional scientific replications were performed by different groups using uh, different, slightly different statistics and slightly different models. But in every case, there were highly statistically significant drops and violence and war deaths and great progress towards peace. Those combined experiments, which have all been published, provide a negligible chance that this was all due to a statistical fluke. The only way to understand this is to change our model of consciousness from something that is 100% brain-centric and localized to within the skull, to something that is unlocalized, a field model of consciousness. 
And when you scientifically explore field models of consciousness based on, say, the electromagnetic field or the field of gravity, they don't work. You're forced to look deeper. And ultimately, field effects of consciousness can be understood in a very straightforward way on the level of these, this deepest level of mind, this deepest level of nature through a unified field-based theory of, of defense, theory of consciousness. There's no time to go into that. I've already taken all my time, but this is one more, and there's several I haven't even discussed, arguments that the unified field of physics, the foundation of the universe, is one and the same as that unified ocean of being which is at the core of the tradition of yoga and at the foundation of Veda, that those two fields are one and the same. You can study it intellectually, objectively through instruments of particle accelerators, and you can get close, or you can just take the incredible instrument of our human mind and develop that mind and allow the mind and consciousness to expand and expand and expand to the experience of being, which is beyond the intellect. The intellect is a discriminative faculty. It distinguishes A and B, but there's no distinction between A and B. The unified field is just pure, unbounded unity. So it is beyond the intellect. So the intellect, I would say, doesn't really know it but you know it by being it. So those are the points I wanted to make today. And I, I brought up that peace point at the end because I wanted to announce that in Hyderabad, coming up on December 29th through February 13th, there'll be a gathering of 10,000 advanced meditators, yogis, for the purposes of generating peace on a global scale. That is enough number, according to previous experiments, to actually put a dent in the violence and hostility and criminal tendencies of the world. I surely hope it works, and I'm certainly going to be there. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank, uh, thank you, Professor Hazelin, for giving this illuminating uh, uh, deliberation on the nature of the universe. I think I heard you as if an ancient Rishi was speaking to us in the language of modern physics. So the unification of matter and mind, the field theory in quantum mechanics with the field theory of consciousness is a new development in uh, understanding of the universe. I think uh, you have unified the ancient wisdom with the modern knowledge and you are an embodiment of the uh, unified knowledge, the grand theory that you have today discussed and nothing could be better as a concluding, concluding lecture of this uh, workshop. So I think uh, uh, it will take long time for us laymen to understand the high nature of physics, but the idea that you have given from the ancient Vedic wisdom that the ultimate reality is consciousness and it is the supreme silence, which we call the Brahman. I think that is a great revolution today and it has come from a scientist. That is why it is appearing to be more authentic. We generally take it for granted that the ultimate reality is supreme consciousness. But if a scientist gives his uh, authority uh, for such a uh, metaphysical view, uh, looks more uh, assuring. And thank you so much for today's, uh, uh, today's wisdom that you have given us. Thank you. Now our participants will... Uh, raise uh, questions and uh, queries. Uh, uh, participants, please come forward questions. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Moon, our Honorable Vice Chancellor of Assam University is listening to the talk. If in case... Yes, you, yeah. yes. Yeah, the, yeah. Before I... Uh, before we take any questions, uh, I would like to uh, 
uh, thank Professor Honorable Vice Chancellor of Sam University, Rajiv Mohan Khan, for joining us. And I would like to uh, request, sir, say a few words uh, before other comments. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was really wonderful associating myself with this you know, session. And it was really a pleasure listening to Dr. Uh, Abhijit Viswasi first, who enlightened us on uh, issues related to artificial intelligence. Uh, many queries, many, many doubts that we had in our mind, he clarified it in a very, very simple uh, manner. It was really wonderful. Thanks to uh, Dr. Abhijiti. And it was really wonderful listening to uh, Professor John Eglins. Uh, the level of enlightenment he has and, you know, he passed on those, you know, wives to us also. I'm a layman to philosophy, but yet listening to uh, uh, Professor John Eglins is really, really wonderful. He talked about uh, samadhi, he talked about, you know, metaphysics, he talked about uh, uh, how yoga and samadhi and meditation can reduce uh, or have reduced uh, uh, admissions to hospitals and all, how it is really, you know, uh, taking to uh, this, leading to uh, consciousness, how it is leading to uh, enlightenment, you know, and uh, uh, how it is uniting. You know, I'm, I'm a really layman to speak on what he has really spoken. It's really wonderful and very, very enlightening. Uh, uh, I thank, uh, you know, Professor John profusely for his very wonderful talk. And I thank uh, uh, Dr. Moon Moon and uh, my, uh, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Nataraju Ji, for giving me this opportunity to listen to such wonderful people. It was really, very, very enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really my pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would also like to request our uh, former director, sir, Professor Adisipali Nataraju, to uh, say a few words, sir, please. Uh, uh, Professor Heglin, uh, this is uh, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm Professor Nataraju. I work at uh, JNU these days, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. Uh, I had great opportunity to listen to you directly at Fairfield 2014. I was listening to you in the Waves Conference. You know, I was a guest at Candice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was staying at Candice Badgett's uh, The Raj Spa. And uh, we heard you live, and it was a it was a great experience. I still remember, you know, uh, yes, we, couldn't get, we couldn't get seats in the auditorium. We were all standing a couple of hours listening to you. <laughs> yeah, and hope to see you in January in Hyderabad. I'll be there. Professor David Sharp was speaking about the program. Uh, that's my hometown, so we'll we'll catch up in January. I'll 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 be there. It's great listening to you, Professor. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, you you bring a lot of authority to what we do, conceptualizing and theorizing from the Vedic uh, knowledge uh, with your uh, uh, expertise in uh, uh, unified field theory. Uh, you know, uh, our, our, our uh, beliefs in metaphysical truth get, get strengthened, you know. <laughs> we, we get a lot of inspiration. And then uh, when we speak about Veda and Vedanta knowledge, a uh, couple of small observations, if you could clarify. Uh, in your, uh, you know, string theory, unified field theory, space time is built into it or is the space time, uh, you know, after the Big Bang? How are you conceptualizing space time within the field theory? That is a very good question, a very deep question. In string theory itself, there's the concept of space because you talk about vibrational degrees of freedom and if a string is vibrating it must be vibrating in some dimension and but it's really fundamentally merely a concept of space but as this universe emerges emerges that concept takes on more concrete substance to tell you a secret from Vedanta, this universe that has emerged, <laughs> it really doesn't emerge. 
it is all a concept within that ocean of consciousness, just like that picture of Lord Narayana with the bubble universes. The reality is timeless, eternal, never changing, never evolving. It's fullness. It is Brahman, the totality, the great reality. And within Brahman is the silence of the absolute. But also within Brahman is the dynamism within that silence. That consciousness is conscious after all. It's not inertia. There's dynamism in consciousness. And that dynamism in consciousness means these these concepts, you know, are living concepts. They're alive and they're bubbling and they're creating percolating universes like ginger ale effervesces bubbles. Bubble universes. So today we talk about the multiverse. What is the multiverse? Well, if this unified field can percolate one universe, the one we believe we live in, then it can percolate more. And the nature of the unified field is to percolate universes like ginger ale effervesces bubbles. And you have that picture of Lord Narayana dreaming up universes like, like bubbles. But all of that universe, including the one in which we believe we live, in which we're physically embedded, is really one of those bubbles. We're living in a bubble universe, which is a snapshot of Brahm. It's one snapshot of a reality which is far bigger. Now, once we're trapped in that reality, once our awareness collapses onto the what we see, there's a whole evolutionary process that goes on and on and on as we evolve from salamanders to humans and the whole universe and galaxies. So within Brahm, the timeless, emerges the notion of time and the notion of space. And those, once you have time and space, you have evolution. But really, Brahm is bigger than that. A mature experience of unbounded awareness, pure consciousness, is incredibly rich and full with limitless possibilities. In this physical world, we're living out one of those possibilities. But on the level of Brahm, they all exist simultaneously as part of the totality. So I'm sorry that's not a simple answer. You've asked a sophisticated question. And uh, the ultimate reality is, is Brahm and only Brahm. Yeah, because in the in many places in the Upanishads, there is this continuous statement that Brahman is beyond time, space, causation, beyond time, space. That's a very routine description. So I was struggling to understand, you know, where to situate Brahman without space. So that was my difficulty with the intellectual difficulty, but otherwise uh, uh, great. I mean, uh, uh, one small, uh, I mean, uh, one more uh, small observation and I will uh, is uh, your understanding, uh, you know, of uh, Vata, Pitta, Kapha as the three aspects of the uh, the prakriti and then they turn into pancha mahabhutas and then the evolution series etc mm, uh, are we equating also the same vata pitta kapha with uh, sattva rajas tamas of the prakriti or does it help in a... that's a very good question uh, rajas sattva tamas are really deeper than vata pitta kapha vata pitta kapha are the finest manifest physical emergence of the unified field but rajas thomas sapa the three gunas are all throughout the veda the whole veda is the play of the gunas i think the bhagavad gita says that the veda's concern is with the three gunas be without the three gunas o arjuna freed from duality ever firm in purity, independent of possessions, possessed of the self. So this, these three gunas exist on the level of the Veda itself. They're part of the mechanics of the Veda, Agni, Mele, Puroitam, Yagnyasya. That's all the play of the three gunas. But it's, it's before the physical universe emerges.
that explains thank you so much and hope to uh, hope to see you in hyderabad uh, thank you thank you professor for your time uh, thank you pradhan sir please take off yeah acha pradhan sir Uh, well, professor, uh, you are taking a couple of more questions. Dr. Moon, uh, do yeah, you have uh, minutes more? Or, uh, or yes, we... if, uh, Professor, if you allow, then we can uh, have a few questions. Otherwise, uh, it's up to... It's, uh, okay, then uh, Dr. Shailendra Ji, uh, please. Thank you so much, Professor. I mean, I have a lot of questions. I don't know from where to start, but just... Uh, let me get few meanings of the term. In Gayatri Mantra, the term is Bhu Bhruvah. So three uh, words they are talking, material word Bhu, Bhava, Bhurva, physical word and the celestial word. So they are talking about the three words. Another term is Dhi Mahi mediating. Om Bhur Bhurva Swaha Tat Savitur Varniyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimai Dhiyo Hiyona Prachodaya. They, they wanted to mediate on the Supreme Light. So I always puzzled in my mind that uh, in so many uh, things uh, in, in, in Vedic philosophy, the focus upon light to understand the Supreme Nature of Reality. That science has uh, ex experience of two uh, two uh, two type of uh, properties applied, like as a wave and as a particle. So, I mean, is there any resemblance to to do with the two scientific and one Vedic uh, uh, symbols of reality? Any any relationship? It's a very good question, and I I, I thought about that a great deal. Um, what could there be that would be in between our physical universe that we're most familiar with, the world of matter, and the absolute? We know, many know anyway, many have experienced, that in addition to this gross physical body, we have a subtler body, a subtler vehicle, a vehicle that has more to do with mind and feeling Depending upon language, you can call that astral body, desire body, thought body, subtle body. And for those of us, for whatever reason, in extreme circumstances or just by one's intention, you can, that body, along with your mind and along with your consciousness, can separate from the physical body and experience a different world. Um, there have been many, many reports of that. Um, I had that under an extreme circumstance, but it's something that one can learn to do. I, I don't encourage it, um, but there is that subtler vehicle that we carry with us. When the physical body dies, that vehicle you the, you don't you don't die. Your your heart, your mind, your emotions continue. Certainly, there's some changes. The perception is different, but you're living at that point in a subtler world. I'll show you a picture of that world if I can. What would it be made of? Well, we're doing, we're publishing research on that right now, both theoretical and experimental. Let me see if I can pull this up just for a second. <coughs> so, you may be aware that 90% of the universe, 90% of our galaxy is invisible. And we know that for a variety of reasons, but we know it for sure, that surrounding our galaxy, which is made of hydrogen and helium and a few heavier elements, is something called a galactic halo. A galactic halo, dark matter. Dark matter is 90% of the mass of our galaxy, yet it's completely invisible. We know it's there. We can measure its gravitational influence but invisible, apart from its gravi gravitational influence. In 1983, 84, I came up with a theory of what dark matter is. That's the standard model of dark matter even today. And that it's a weakly interacting massive particle, WIMPs. Weakly interacting massive particles 
in theories like supersymmetry, and I talked about supersymmetry today, are inevitable. And they form the majority of the mass in our universe. But in that early theory of dark matter, these hidden particles, these invisible particles, these they're weak, they're called weakly interacting particles because they, apart from gravity, they just don't interact with anything, not even with themselves. They're inert, they're lifeless, they're useless, they're uninteresting. We haven't been able to see them, even with the most sensitive detectors. We simply know they're there. But that theory is no longer one I favor because in string theory, dark matter or weakly interacting supersymmetric particles, WIMPs, decay after a million years or so. They don't last till today, not nearly. They decay into something else. They decay into what is called microcharged dark matter. And microcharged dark matter is matter that has a tiny bit of electrical charge. And having a little bit of electrical charge, it interacts with us because, you know, electromagnetism, it feels the influence of electromagnetism. So it interacts with us electromagnetically, but faintly because it only has an electric charge about a billionth of the charge of an electron. So it's called microcharged dark matter. But that microcharge, that little bit of electric charge is enough to transform the hidden sector world into an incredibly vibrant world, an incredibly vibrant world filled with light. And this hidden sector world, although filled with light, the light of the hidden sector world is not the photon that we're familiar with and that our eyes have been trained to see. It's another photon. It's a second photon. It's a massless photon, but it doesn't interact with, it doesn't interact with, uh, it doesn't interact with us much. So this hidden world has its own light. It's a very dynamic world. In this world, you will form, you have particles, charged, microcharged, that would form atoms, molecules, possibly organisms, planets. But the thing about this hidden sector world is that it is cold, ghostly cold. You can calculate its temperature to be about 1.7 degrees above absolute zero. But what effect does that being so cold have? It means this is a world that is ruled not by classical physics of Newton. It's a world that is governed by quantum mechanics, quantum theory, superposition. And if our subtle body is made out of this, and it better be because there's nothing else we can think of that it could be made of, if we have a subtle body that lives in this world, but is attached to us electrostatically, we have charge. It has charge. It will be attached to us like glad wrap, like cellophane wrap clings to your hand. You can take it off if you have to. Sometimes it's not easy. Like that, the subtle body can be removed from our physical body and is free to go its own way at the time of death and continue to evolve. So this hidden sector world is a superfluid world, has tremendous advantages, which we don't have time to go into, but it explains long range field effects of consciousness, phenomena like ESP and feeling how your young child is doing from a distance and being aware of catastrophe. It explains those things quite readily. Um, and it also has a very useful, if we have, a, if we have a, a subtle body made of hidden sector matter that is super cooled, that obeys the laws of quantum mechanics, that means our brain, which is really a digital computer, a very sophisticated digital computer, we have neurons wired together by nerve cells, I should say, 
wired, wired together by neurons in this digital web. A neuron fires or it doesn't fire. It's one or zero. So our brain is a, a, it's a digital computer, but it's, it's a very certainly sophisticated one. And yet human beings, human souls, can do things that computers can never do. I can argue based on firm principles that a computer can't do the sort of mathematics we need to do, for example, to do quantum mechanics, especially quantum field theory and unified field theory. It, in principle, cannot, never. We have capabilities that computers don't have. We can appreciate a fine work of art. A computer can copy that piece of work at art and can turn the yellow into green, but is it appreciating the work of art? No. Is the computer conscious? No, a digital computer will never be conscious. Quantum computer, maybe. So if our subtle body is made of this hidden sector matter, is governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, our physical brain has, as if you wish, a coprocessor, a quantum coprocessor, a quantum computer as a coprocessor. And it's that quantum computer that allows the human brain to do the marvelous things that human beings can do and that robots cannot. So that was a long foray. You can see there's a lot to talk about there, but in essence, I think that is the answer to your question, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, am, am I allowed to just raise, I mean, I, I'll write, can I write a mail to you to get the answers of so many I mean, queries are there? So, Please uh, do. Uh, in Kavalya Pada, they have a first aphorism in Yoga Sutra. They said that Janma Ausadi Mantra Tapa Samadhi Jasiddhya. There are four ways to uh, achieve the Siddhis. That is uh, from birth by Aushadi, medicine, mantra, and tapasya. So, have you people started any research to uh, how to attain the Samadhi in, as mentioned in Samadhi Pada, uh, Kavalya Pada in Yoga Sutra? Yes, um, we're focused on that. I spent hours a day uh, doing that practice, and everybody here at MIU spends a lot of time with the Yoga Sutras and the TM, the Siddhis, Chapter 3 on Sanyama. And um, so yoga, transcending, is the most direct route, <laughs> the most direct route. However, tapas means withdrawing the senses from their overwhelming saturation and environmental pleasures so that it's it's a stepping stone to allowing the attention to turn within a little bit of I wouldn't say austerity but i would say balance in life is helpful on the path of yoga and helpful um, to produce the cities by medicines in the vedic literature particularly i'd say in the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda, and in um, Samaved, soma is a medicine, but very, very subtle. A very subtle medicine, which uh, has not been recently located on planet Earth, as far as I know, but in principle, particularly in the Himalayas, it was historically, is believed to be found there. But our own bodies manufacture it. Our own bodies, especially in these subtle, subtle states of meditation, start to produce ojas and soma. And the somas help us, what, let's say, it, they supercharge the mind and they help us more quickly forge new connections and create powerful brainwave coherence. And it's this powerful brainwave coherence where the entire brain is engaged in every action, every thought. That's where cities become possible. That in the purification of the body, asanas and austerity, helps the process by cleaning out the channels of the flow of energy and the shashumna and the pingala and all that stuff, clearing out the channels of flow of energy in the body uh, are also helpful to bring the maturity, the cities into a more mature state. The practice mainly is uh, what what Patanjali sets forth in chapter three of the Yoga Sutras, which is this process known as Sanyama. 
Sanyama is the, defined as the simultaneous application of Dharan, concentration, Dhyan, meditation, and Samadhi. People have spent centuries trying to figure out what in the world that means and how to practice it. Marshi Marsh Yogi always said, my joy is making the complex simple. And he clarified what the practice of Sanyama really is. And it is a simple practice, but it's really only fruitful on the, on the ground of having a certain amount of Samadhi already developed which comes through regular practice of transcending transcendental meditation. Very good questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. So much, Pranam. Uh, uh, there are actually a few questions in chat box. Uh, so do you want to address those? Uh, uh, please unmute. Uh, uh, Professor John. Yeah. I'll take a quick look. I have a class in 15 minutes. Let me just okay. see. Okay, okay, okay. But so, I tell you what, I can be reached easily at the email address president at miu.edu. And I welcome your correspondence. I'm also here with uh, wonderful Professor David Scharf, who spoke at the conference. Uh, he and I are close proximity here. Um, anyway, so I can be reached, and um, as time allows, I and a lot, assuming I have an answer to these questions, I may not. But if I do, I'll, I'll make the time to respond. Now uh, I will ask very quickly, Kalani, please uh, raise your question, Kalani Dash, very quickly, a very brief question. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, first of uh, first of all, Professor. First and foremost, physics has never been this fun. So thank you. Thank you very much for this lecture. And so uh, uh, my question is like very simple question. Um, what are the current uh, endeavors of string theory? Um, the cur the, what are the current what again of string theory? The current endeavors. Like is there like okay. if, uh, string theory is uh, delving into something much deeper or? Yes, um, string theory is exploring some very interesting and rather esoteric realities of our universe. This idea of the metamorphosis of one string theory into another, hidden in that mathematics are some remarkable realities. We, for example, are accustomed to viewing our world as three-dimensional plus time. It turns out there is an equally valid and simpler way of viewing our universe as two-dimensional plus time. Really? Everything sure looks three-dimensional to me. But... That depends on how we're raised. And not, not all animals see the world as three-dimensional. They view distance in a different way than we do. It's two-dimensional for a cat, for example. Depending upon how we're brought up, the, we, you know, the, the language of our parents, the language of our environment, the concepts that we're surrounded by, we, as a, we're a young child of one month old, two months, three months, we adopt the framework and we all see the world as three-dimensional. But the world is simpler, viewed, viewed as a two-dimensional universe with a very different set of particles and a very different set of forces. And for doing complex physical pro physics problems, it's best to throw away the three-dimensional picture of things and, and use a far simpler two-dimensional model. And you'll get the right answer because that two-dimensional view of the universe is the same as our three-dimensional view. You can translate from one to the other. So the idea that we're living in a three-dimensional universe, but had we been brought up differently, we might see the world as vastly different. Sort of shows a little bit about the Maya of life. 
reality is what we make of it. Um, so there are other things too. What goes on in the center of a black hole? How does the collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics happen? String theory is illuminating all kinds of things we, we couldn't answer before. Quantum mechanics is full of mysteries. Many of those mysteries are dissolved. They go away in string theory. So there's a lot yet to learn and a lot yet to unfold. One of the awkwardnesses of string theory is this. The universe that emerges from it has great flexibility. We live in a universe of four forces and a handful of fundamental particles from which everything is made, our bodies, our lunch, everything. But string theory has remarkable flexibility. It could create a universe with a different number of forces and particles, even a different number of dimensions. And in fact, the number of universes that are possible within string theory is a very large number of universes with different laws of nature, estimated at about 10 to the 500 power. That's a lot of different universes. Well, how can we live in this one? Why do we live in it? There could be so many. Well, most of those universes don't support life. <laughs> and many of them are very short-lived. They only live for a fraction of a second. Some of them explode and tear themselves apart quickly. But the possibilities are absolutely endless. And we live in one that is inhabitable. That's why we live in this one. We couldn't have ever evolved in a universe that was uninhabitable. So we see the universe we see. It's our only choice. But what's interesting is, this is a strength and a weakness of string theory. The weakness being, physicists say, well, no, no, no. The super string has to explain why it's this universe, why we have these forces and these particles. Well, it sort of does because it explains that, no, they're all the universes, but this is the only one we're going to see. But then physicists will say, but it's so uneconomical. It's so vastly wasteful to produce 10 to the 500 universes that are uninhabitable and that will never be enjoyed. Well, actually, the secret is, and this is Vedanta, this is Shankara, Shankara. None of these universes are actually created. They all exist within the absolute. All possibilities, all possibilities exist within the within the Ved, within the absolute. And with more and more evolution of consciousness, we can access more and more of those possibilities. We can transcend the universe we're in, but still have an, that expanded consciousness that can see others. So life holds incredible treasures. I wish I were younger when I learned to meditate and we're even farther along and we're enjoying more of the fruits of yoga. But life is a field of all possibilities, all possibilities. And the potential of human life is great. And that's when I see the world today in the Middle East and other areas so fraught with the darkness of chaos and ignorance and human race creating more such more bad karma after more bad karma in a dim future. I really wish that the experience of unbounded awareness and the practice of yoga were more commonly available in all the schools. Many schools already, thousands, but we need more. Everybody has the birthright for enlightenment. Everybody has this treasure of the human brain. Everybody has access to enlightenment in this lifetime with the, with the powerful tools that exist within the Vedic tradition. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, kindly unmute uh, when not audible. 
Yeah, you can you can now thank the professor. Yes, can, right. Yeah. Asif Pradhan ji is there and the vice chancellor. Yes. You can thank everybody and then. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much, Professor Haglin. I mean, it was a, such a wonderful talk, and it's a real a pleasure to listen to you. I mean, almost two hours has passed, and. Uh,